session, though the name indicates SICS, it is a way back 30 years old topic, I'll make it into a modern topic. I have the experience of uh, four decades in this, where uh, some of my students are here. So this is my experience. So there are my books uh, which are available in online. You place, please go through them. This is a case of femtocataract. I'm also a femtocataract surgeon. So where the nucleus is made into soft, the entire thing is aspirated and we inject the lens at the end. Why I am showing this video is, as a, a small incision surgeon, keep this in mind, do the surgery. I should compete with this fellow. So a femto is a rich man diet, which can be distributed the same cost to so many poor patients. The learning curve for small incision is much smaller or shorter than the FACO surgeon. For these cases, you have to depend on SICS. These are the cases you should be thorough with the SICS. Morning we have seen with a soft cataract, they are struggling to do the FACO. I can do SICS in these cases in two to three minutes. For black cataract, they damage the cornea. I will not damage it with SICS. This is a corneal opacity, you can remove the nucleus in total. You need not make into small pieces in FACO. The small incision fellows are hypermature cataracts, whereas the femto fellows are early six by six cataracts. When there is a failure in the mission, you cannot postpone the case. You can proceed with the SICS. To compete with FACO fellows, you have to acquire some of these modern gadgets like topographer, modern biometer, high-end viscos, bimanual manuals, and the vitrectomy and things. When you are investing, don't invest on these two. You are investing on the car which is used for a few hours, investing on jewelry which is kept in the locker. This investment you keep on this high-end equipment. The advantage of SICS is the wound is much stronger than the FACO wound and you can dispose all your uh, used equipment at the end of the case or at the end of the day so that there is no task, no infection. So for capsulotomy, you can use one rupee needle or four crores machine. The IOLs use this you need not stick on to PMMA. You can shift to foldables, you can shift to premium lenses with the SICS. The notion is when the SICS, this should be PMMA, need not be. What is the advantage of foldable is no PCO. If you in implant hydrophobic lenses, no PCO. You can compete, I can also in in implant a uh, premium lenses. For FACO fellow, you require six organs like two hands, two legs, two ears to so hear the sound. Whereas the uh, SICS fellow, they can close the ears, hear the music and do the job. The steps for modern SICS are, you require a preoperative front side of the cornea topographer, back side of the cornea endothelium, the uh, back side of the eye OCT and a good biometer. So with this, you can promise the patient with 6.6 six or 6.5 six vision. Anesthesia, previously we used to bombard the eye. Don't use those long needles. Use a short, short needle. It is a true perfect peribulbar. Otherwise, sub in, in injection. Don't uh, perforate the globes. Previously, we used to put a superior stitch for the SICS. If you put superior rector stitch, it will result in TOSI. Avoid the superior rector stitch. The conjunctival peritomy, we used to aim for 180 degrees. Don't do that. 
the conjunctiva is necessary for your brother. Your brother is a glaucoma surgeon. The next thing is cartery. If you do cartery, it is a crime. Cartery results in sin. Sin means sterile uh, necrosis of the sclera. So surgically induced sterile necrosis of the sclera, this is one of our uh, case referred to me with a necrosis of the uh, sclera and a prolapse of the iris as well as ciliary body. How to avoid this cautery is you can put one or two drops of adrenaline or use eraser cautery. So a tunnel that needs no toric eye wells, even though the cylinder, you can correct the cylinder by, mon by ad adopting this technique. There are nomograms to correct the, your cylinder. So in the anterior capsular rexis, you want a central circular correct rexis, which is used with a rexis marker. 5 mm rexis markers are available, which you can do correct rexis. So this is my old video in 90s. So I prepared where there is a uh, rexis, afterwards hydro procedure, so hydro dissection, hydro delinea uh, delineation and prolapse of the nucleus and expression or the delivery of the nucleus with visco. So here we used to select those days the cases as NS1, NS2 soft cataracts and I used to do the uh, uh, SICS hard cataracts, I used to do uh, ECC those days. Nowadays, no exception, any cataract you can do SICS. So that is my uh, 90s video, how I used to do the rexis, polishing of the capsule, and even uh, you can dial uh, these lenses with the help of your simco. So in the modern SICS, you see the incision is called as smart incision. What is the smart incision is incision along the steeper axis. So the steeper axis in majority of the time it is temporal. So temporal incision, so you see how the fixation is fixation with the ring and the uh, rexis marker uh, along with the marker you will make a perfect rexis. You can enlarge it depending on that. Generally, we enlarge to 6 to 6.5 uh, thing. Depending on your astigmatism, you can plan the thing. You, uh, you prefer always with the visco expression. The another important thing I teach is do with bimanual IA. Don't use Simco. Bimanual IA gives smaller openings, well controlled AC, and it will open the capsular bag you can thoroughly, 100% you remove the cartet and even you can polish with bimanual. See how I am closing the conjunctiva. Conjunctiva is closing by fibrin glue. Fibrin glue. The best dressing for the eye is the conjunctiva. So this is a case of subluxated cataract where I can do the SF lens, whereas the FACO surgeon generally refers to retina surgeon. So this also, the entire lens is expressed as intracapsular lens by injecting helon, not the methyl cellulose. Inject the helon, prolapse it, and suture. What extra instrument you require is 10-0 proline. So this is for the beginners or the postgraduates, how to do the uh, videos not coming. Uh, hydro dissection, the clue is they lift the anterior capsule. Generally, they inject there only at the margin, no dissection. You pass near, nearer to the equator and inject it. Half, quarter cc is enough. So hydro dissection, you depress this 27 gauge cannula until it touches the skull and separate the skull from the skull. So the other technique you feel, the student feel this rexis is small, the nucleus is large. It is, the button is large, button hole is small. You pass this and make the rexis vertical instead of circular. In the vertical rexis, it 
goes. That means don't do vertical rectus. At that time, it stresses as vertical and prolastic. So this is how again, again I express the nucleus with visco. The clue or the trick or the tip here is depress the posterior lip, continuously inject the visco, use the large visco cannula. The technique here is the train going in the tunnel. So the train going in the tunnel means you depress the posterior lip, elevate the anterior lip, traction horizontally. The student always tries to lift it. Though if you lift it, you are removing the endothelium. Don't lift. Press, press to the rail. It will come out. Your cornea is clear. The other thing is divide the nucleus in the AC. The trick here is you take a cannula, cut it uh, to and fro motions, inject the visco, you get the separation, and you can deliver this nuclei in 4 mm in section. The other method I invented is the uh, nucleus is tracked in the tunnel. So that the clue here is you prepare your own vectors having a triangular shape, not as a circular. Triangle, the tip of the triangle is anterior. That sharp edge will cut the nucleus into one third, then push it back in the longitudinal fashion. You can deliver it so that you can minimize the size of the incision. This is uh, how what I teach the recently the parse plana vitrectomy for an anterior segment surgeon. What you need is a trocar and cannula, which your friend retina friend is using. They are disposable. So you take a trocar and cannula. How you have to push this trocar and cannula, you learn four millimeters from the limbus and remove it. So now this is a subluxated hypermature cataract. Again, I am delivering with visco. So then start doing a vitrectomy, which is minimal and avoiding the hydration. At the end, you remove the cannula and there is no need of suture and the patient also doesn't know where you have done the surgery. So that is called parse plana vitrectomy. So this is a fish hook method where you can deliver hardest nucleus. This all you know. If it is a very soft nucleus, as you see in PPC, you can divide like this with the help of chopper. So this is blue menthol technique for the paucity of time I am going fast. So this even today we are doing this technique in our institute medivision. So where you have to maintain the anti anterior chamber maintainer and depress it. What is the fun of this is you are maintaining the anterior chamber throughout the procedure. Next idea, cornea is clear. Snare technique, the JIS people are supplying the snare, but they are charging 12,000 rupees. So the next thing is sandwich technique, each and everything a body is no set, but the tr trick here is the uh, dialer will help to protect the endothelium and the cornea. So today what uh, is different from that day is thorough preoperative pre evaluation with costly equipment, specular microscopy, topographer, uh, and uh, OCT, all are costly. Don't think they are not, they are the instruments for FACO fellows. They are the instruments for you also. Then topical anesthesia, you can do it. So uh, don't use uh, superior rectus suture. Make the conjunctiva as small as possible, 5 mm. You don't cauterize too much. It is a crime to cauterize. Then use a smart incision, not the small incision. Smart incision means depending on the astigmatism. Use uh, a sharp uh, instrument and uh, the rexis you measure and do it. The nuclear delivery, visco, either blue menthol or visco delivery. Cortical cleanup, always use bimanual, not your chin hair. So the hydrophobic lenses. Don't think hydrophobic lenses are those fellows, for fellows. It is for you because it avoids the PCO. 
if there is a PCO, what the patient says is, doctor, your surgery is failure. Again, I got cataract. Again, my vision is fallen. So don't close the conjuncta with cautery. You feel happy with cautery, I closed it. Cautery means you are damaging the conjunctiva. So do use with uh, fibrin glue. So at the end, uh, remove the visco. Oh, think that the visco is a foreign body. So because visco causes uh, inflammation and raised pressure, you think it as a foreign body, remove the foreign body, and uh, uh, best dressing is the conjunctiva, best shield is the lid. So uh, the postoperatively, you don't use the list of medicines, use only two drops, minimal medication, maximum outcome. The same can be served in a small incision, same carried in, uh, served in a femto. It is your choice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir, for your, your excellent presentation. And the practical tips covered in SICS were really, really helpful to all of us, sir. Uh, I think now uh, SICS definitely does play a role, apart from FACO, whenever we are trying to deal with especially heart cataracts, and if you are a beginner in FACO, and even sometimes if uh, there are other complications, like you know where, is, where there is a compromised endothelium, even then also we can definitely go for SICS in difficult cases. So thank you, sir. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm happy to uh, answer. The razor cautery is, it is similar to your ball point. Surrounding is one electrode, central is one electrode. Isn't it? Your ball point. Central is the needle, surrounding is the no? Two electrodes are there. It delivers minimal energy. Erase it. So it will uh, erase the smaller capillaries. So that's why they are called as eraser. It will not hurt your sclera. So we are hurting the vessels, not the sclera. Isn't it? So the cautery you have seen, one is the fire, another is the petrol. Fire is the cautery, petrol is the steroid. So next day onwards you put steroid, steroids, some of the patients even give oral steroid, isn't it? All the steroids and the damage to the sclera, scleral shrinkage, scleral necrosis, and it attracts a lot of astigmatism. So that's why you wait, it will stop. So how long you have to wait? Till the bleeding time, till the clotting time. Every tissue, the blood will stop, even you cut the inferior vena cava. Yes? Ah. Yeah, fibrin glue, what, uh, you want the brand or uh, how? You, you want, you, you the Reliance people are supplying, uh, the best is Baxter. I have no financial instead. You use a Baxter, you, uh, suppose you have posted 50 cases. For one while, you can use 50 cases, 50 drops. One drop is enough, don't put second drop. Second drop is against the enemy. It costs a thicker. One drop of this, one drop of that. Shush. So next day, you can say, I have done PACO. You can remove your patch after three hours. Yes? Same you apply for your therizium. Therizium glue only. See, nothing like if you deposit the tissue in the same place without hurting. The patient will appreciate you. You have done a very good job. Yes? I am better than FACO, I am telling. FACO fellows who cannot correct the astigmatism. I can correct astigmatism. Same time I am a FACO fellow. Same time I am a FEMTO fellow. But I can correct the my astigmatism, but not the with FACO. FACO, I always advise toric lenses. Why means there are nanograms, go to it, for which the best fellow is uh, uh, Jagannath Bormani. Uh, he has given very nice uh, nanograms. Uh, if you want to correct 1.5, if you want to correct 1, if you want to correct 2. Liberally, you can give incision. 
straight incision will cause more astigmatism, prone incision will cause less astigmatism, temporal causes less astigmatism, superior causes more astigmatism. If you are closer to the cornea, more astigmatism. By that you can correct it. How you will become master, I don't know your name. Name? Agam, what you have to do is, you calculate your own cases of 20 or 30. Oh, with this I can correct like this. So I studied 200 cases those days of my SICS. Ultimately, my astigmatism was 0.62. I can correct with my incision 0.62. The other, my own assistant used to correct 1.5. His correction. Yes? Fibrin glue? Fibrin glue, instantaneously it will attach. While, uh, same day, same day, <laughs> same day you cannot keep for the next day, same day, same day you have to complete. If you are a volume surgeon only, you are can afford, because it is 10,000 rupees. Delicil also, same, same day, but uh, 4,000 means uh, that is uh, half of the uh, dose. But it is less effective than that of Baxter. You, you try both. But at least you have 10 cases, it is valuable. 10, 20 cases. Or share with your friend. Ah. No, it is not related to depth, it is the strength. Depth is related to the strength, not with the astigmatism. Astigmatism is due to the extent and the architecture. If you make a square, almost nil. Whereas if it is a make a horizontal, it induces. If you are closer to the cornea, it induces. Ah. Okay. So in my experience, So in my experience, it is depth is not matter. The depth always I go for one third to half the thickness of the sclera. It is just one to one point five millimeters away from the limbus. No, no. Where do you get from? serum or the same blood you can use but you are not sure of it so sometimes it will come out isn't it if you are sure means you have to use fibrin you can try see some of the our own colleagues they are neither cauterizing nor using fibrin they just deposit the conjunctiva next day okay but not hundred percent isn't it we need hundred percent even one patient is unhappy, that day we won't sleep, isn't it? My volume is 100 patient, but one patient is unhappy means oh, I, we won't get the sleep. I want 100%. Next. Next topic is by Dr. Sujata. Uh, she'll be speaking on post-op refractive surprise. A very good morning to all of you. So today I will be talking about post-operative refractive surprises following cataract surgery. So I would be discussing this topic under four headings, etiology, prevention, diagnosis, and management. So normally, what is post-refractive surprise? It's nothing but failure to achieve the intended post-operative refractive target in a patient. So uh, when we study the cataract surgery outcomes, so in 50 to 70% of patients, we notice that Point, uh, normally we can achieve a refraction of 0.5 diopters and in 70 to 94% it's one diopter. Factors influencing this refractive outcome can be divided into preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative. So preoperative ca causes we should never ever look in, uh, uh, miss looking into the patient's files. It could be just a right, uh, uh, wrong lens that has been implant implanted in a patient or it could be just a wrong eye selection, inaccurate biometry, 
or uh, it's less right less can let right left confusion or sometimes even an optimal i oil power not available in the stock so generally it's because of inaccurate biometry or i oil power uh, miscalculation that results in this post refractive surprises so coming to biometry pitfalls in axillent measurement in uh, it would occur because for every 0.3 mm of error in axillent measurement one diopter refractive error can occur and these could be the sources of error like globe irregularities intraocular material poor ocular fixation as in nystagmus or uh, any oculometer dysfunction in human errors as well and uh, these errors in axillent measurement are higher in eyes with ax higher longer eyes and then shorter eyes and in patients with macular streptomyelin silicon filled eyes and keratometric errors it's generally one is to one ratio an error of one diopter leads to an error of a uh, one, one diopter error of keratometry can re result in one diopter post operative refractive surprise and these could be the sources of uh, keratometric errors and uh, we should always exclude uh, uh, dry eye disease epithelial basement membrane disease and salzman's nodular degeneration and even pterygiums whenever we are doing keratometry and we should avoid using any drops prior to doing keratometry so these are just a glance through the normal physiological values and these are the formulas available in our armamentarium so these are the different generation formulas now we are going ahead with actually fourth generation formulas barrett's and uh, olson's and then uh, holiday too and uh, yes we should always be very very particular about the formula we choose while doing uh, i know i will calculation so these are the different this is the norm that we generally use and nowadays it's barrett's and uh, barrett's which is really really useful to us barrett's universal 2 so that uh, addresses all uh, axillent uh, uh, and we can get uh, predictive error in predictive uh, results in all the axillent patients in uh, with all the axillents and uh, these are the virgins based formulas and it which uh, barrett's universal 2 comes under virgins based formulas and now we have hill rbs and rbf and our ray tracing formulas like olson also available in our armamentarium and future trends so now barrett's universal 2 is very promising and something like lada super formula has also come up and olson's is also very promising which uses ray tracing technology and new uh, instruments available for biometry like iol master 700 and lens star uh, I will master 700 has addressed many problems like uh, you know uh, uh, able to calculate the axial length in uh, dense cataracts and also patients with poor fixation and uh, we should never ever forget to go i mean uh, predict the uh, calculate the effective lens uh, position which is very very important and we in barrett's universal 2 we have all these predictors of elp because this determines uh, the post uh, post operative refraction and uh, uh, next coming to the other special si uh, situations like history we should never ever forget to go for history of refractive surgery and keratoconus and uh, this uh, the uh, calculation of i oil power following refractive surgery is a completely different topic but again clinical history method would definitely yield good results and uh, coming to intraoperative causes so it could be norm it could be just a decentration of rexus by 0.4 millimeters which can result in a refractive surprise or incomplete overlap of the i oil or decentration of, of even a monofocal aspheric eye wall also causes post-operative refractive sur surprises. So uneventful cataract surgery is integral to maintain effective lens position and the target refraction. And we should also be very careful about the surgical induced astigmatisms and we should always calculate our own personalized, uh, our own A constants. We should personalize our own A constants to optimize the refractive outcomes. So during surgery, even if the placement of eye oil changes from capsular back to sealage is sulcus, this is a norm that can be used to titrate our eye oil power. And uh, coming to the post-operative causes, shift of eye oil or eye oil tilt or even late causes like capsular block syndrome or anterior capsular contraction syndrome can also result in refractive surprises. So then how do we prevent it? So reconfirmation of keratometry is required in all these situations. And even reconfirmation of axial length is required whenever there is discrepancy of about 0.7 millimeters be be bo between both eyes and measurements that even don't correlate with the patient's refractive error. And we should uh, never forget to optimize our A constant. And these are some of the online resources for uh, you know A constant optimization. So this is very helpful. And uh, now, come how do we diagnose the cause? So we should always wait for one month till the refractive error gets stabilized after surgery. The, till the refraction gets stabilized after surgery. So we need to go for a complete cyclopegic refraction. We, we, have, we have to recheck the patient's history. We have to re uh, go with the, we have to reevaluate the surgical records of the patient. And we have to see which eye oil we have implanted. So we have to repeat everything. And if no so source of error is evident, then we, we have to presume that it is because of effective lens, uh, improper effective lens position. 
So how do we manage it? It could be conservative. So by spectacles or contact lenses. Contact lenses can be used in patients with anisometropia or high astigmatism. Or uh, uh, we have to titrate whether it's uh, my, uh, cylindrical error or a spherical error. If spherical error, myopic error is generally well tolerated. And uh, my multifocal eye oils, they are less tolerant. EDOFs are well tolerant again. And hyperopic surprises is very difficult to handle. And cylindrical errors, minimal cylindrical error, it enhances depth of focus. We don't need to worry much. But if it's more, much more, we, have, we need to address that. So if uh, we have to go for a laser vision correction if the error is less than one diopter, but we have to exclude all the other contraindications for this. And if it's more than one diopter, go with an eye oil exchange or a piggy bag eye oil. So eye oil exchange is challenging. And uh, use a virgin's formula while uh, calculating the eye oil exchange. And then piggyback eye oil, yes, this is an optimal choice whenever we don't know the eye oil power that has been implanted or in hyperopic surprise. And uh, this is how this is the norm used to calculate the piggyback eye oil. And this is the norm used for uh, calculating the eye oil exchange power, which needs to be implanted. And uh, if uh, it's suppose if it's not a spherical error but a cylindrical error, less than one diopters, we need to go with uh, uh, LRIs, uh, uh, otherwise limbal relaxing incisions, or if it's an eye oil misplacement, uh, a to a toric eye oil misplacement, not placed properly, we have to go for rotation. So then these are some of the an online calculators for uh, this, and uh, this is the algorithm which we follow for uh, the er target, I mean, treating the errors. And finally, never forget who your patient is. So never try to you know, treat patients, uh, uh, I mean, by surgical modalities in patients who are expecting perfect uh, results. And then uh, thorough clinical examination is mandatory. And then according to the algorithm, we need to address the patient. And timing, it's always better that we plan multifocal eye oils or read-off eye oils within a span of two weeks. Both eyes need to be operated within two weeks. And then, uh, uh, th uh, then uh, we have to wait for one month for any procedure to perform, but eye oil rotation can be taken up within seven days also. Otherwise, uh, eye oil exchange can be planned, uh, uh, planned within four months. And future, we have light adjust uh, le and lenses, and uh, which can, with the help of UV light, we can ad uh, almost adjust up to two diopters of a lens, two diopters of uh, spherical error, and even perfect lens, which is coming up, which would be coming up in future, we would be able to address implanted, I mean, uh, the error of the eye oil up to 10 diopters with femo femtosecond laser. So con to conclude, so we need to optimize the ocular surface, integrate uh, the latest generation formulas, and use best op use optical uh, biometry, which is gold standard. And residual refractive errors uh, should be evaluated uh, clinically thoroughly. And uh, never forget to even evaluate the retina. So depending on this, d uh, using the algorithm, we can definitely treat the patient. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. A nice presentation and uh, nicely covered in the short time. Uh, what is the uh, clue, uh, what is lacking in us is the feedback. How many people are recording? So in one patient, I got this. The second patient, I got this. Hundredth patient, I got this. If you analyze this, automatically you are own, uh, you, uh, your feature is your own mind. Nobody does this. So if you make something like a research, uh, first at least 20 cases, biometry and mining. Say for example, one patient is going plus side, one patient is going minus side. Immediately they change to 0.5 uh, under correction or over correction. Oh, yesterday patient is, I got plus 0.5, uh, uh, today I'll keep a uh, 0.5 extra. By one patient you go, don't come to a conclusion. Analyze some cases, then you are the master of it. So that's how I learned my uh, technique and my uh, thing. So the commonest thing is the refractionist. We throw them on the refractionist, do the scan, do the eyewell master, do that. So that is the source for the errors in our setup. So rely on a one particular fellow or one or two fellows who are committed for it not generally press buttoning, press press button and get the day result. Isn't it? That is the common source of the biometric error. Any questions? So yes. one patient referred from one of my students, you know, the preoperative astigmatism was 2.5. Postoperative astigmatism is 4.5. Isn't it? Why he has not analyzed which is the steeper axis, which is the flatter axis. He did SICS, 
in the same axis. So it is enhanced to 4.5, very much unhappy patient. How I treated is by sulcoflex lens. The immediately after the implant, the next day is 6.6 and the astigmatism 0.25. So sulcoflex lens is one of the best lens, but it's the most costly. Where the procedure is done in three minutes or four minutes, and no trauma to the eye. The explanting the lens and implanting the lens, as he said, is a challenging. Yes. Is a challenging. It will result in some other things. Another thing is, don't promise any of your doctors, any of your lawyers, any of your judges, I'll achieve to emetropia. Even with all these instruments, you may have, uh, may land in small errors, which sometimes I may have to prescribe glasses. Under promise, over deliver. Yes. That's the dictum. Uh, in quest of time, we'll go to the next topic. Uh, dealing the post-operative complications. Neha? Uh, the post-operative complications which happen in uh, post-cataract surgery. It is okay to have a complication. If you are having a complication, that means you are a very good surgeon and you've been doing volumes, that's why you get complications. So getting a complication is not the same. To start with, this is the first case uh, which presented us uh, on uh, day one post-op and this is how it looked. The surgeon was uh, very panicking. He said, uh, I have an end of case. Can you please deal with it? But uh, this is stars. So how do we know whether it is stars or an endophthalmitis? So we look for all these features. Uh, the onset, if it is within a day or two, uh, then suspect stars. There is uh, no lead edema. There is uh, hardly any pain when you have stars. Visual acuity is moderate to severe. The IOP is high in stars. The corneal edema is limbus to limbus. The anterior chamber reaction is quite severe with fibrin, uh, mild in uh, TARS and marked in endophthalmitis. The pupil is fixed and dilated in TARS. You have mild vitreous involvement. Uh, the culture is always negative and patients markedly respond to steroids. Whenever you have a TARS, it is always important to do a B scan and see whether the vitreous is involved or not. And you need a follow up B scan every day, the every next day so that you won't miss on endophthalmitis. So what are the common causes? Why would a TARS occur? It could be because of your trifan blue, for you, which you use for lens staining, then the uh, viscosurgical devices which you use. It could be because of the IOL per se itself. The parent ca patient's characteristics also, the most common being the diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hyperlimiturtia, and even a renal patient. Sometimes it could be because of uh, surgical instrument uh, contamination and uh, use of these enzymatic agents and even the ultrasonic cleaning baths. Uh, the ETO instruments also can cause uh, TARS. And uh, nowadays uh, there's a lot of usage of intracameral antibiotics. Uh, so that can also lead to TARS in some of the cases. So how do we prevent it? Uh, you look for a patient, uh, do a B scan, and you see the reaction on the first day, put him on hourly steroids and wait and watch for the next day. The main clue or the main important thing which you could do in a TAS patient is seeing him every other day. Sometimes uh, uh, they could be refracted to steroid treatment, and you can also use a recom intracameral recombinant uh, tissue plasma activator. And sometimes if you think the task is not going away and uh, suspicion is there, there are cases where we could even do a surgical intervention and uh, do an anti-chamber washout with tracheotomy or an IVL removal. So this is the next case uh, which had come to us uh, where a patient had done a cataract surgery and the uh, patient had a corneal decompensation along with stars. So this is how we dealt with the case. The patient was aphrakic, so we thought of fixing it up on uh, one go. So we did the NSF5OL first, followed by uh, a vitrectomy. I do a complete vitrectomy for my SF5OL cases. And 
then uh, we'll do an injectable uh, three-piece eye oil through the same uh, faker wound. This is an uh, VRS technique. where we tuck the haptics into the uh, scleral tunnels. So sometimes uh, I wanted to present this case because they can be tasked sometimes even in the late stages. This was a two month old uh, case. There was uh, vitreous in AC, which was constantly causing uh, a low grade uh, inflammatory reaction in the AC. So sometimes, Tasks do put it even in the late stages. So this is my next case where uh, a patient presented with a, a hypopion and it was quite uh, clear cornea and uh, this is how it has progressed to the next day. So this is the most challenging and dreadful complication I could say. It could be because of any organism, it is endophthalmitis. If you don't deal it at the correct point of time, it can lead to permanent blindness. Uh, the trend nowadays, there's a lot of antimicrobial resistance because of indiscriminate use of antibiotics. Where do these come from? The main uh, area could be the ocular surface uh, or the paraocular uh, infection. What are the risk factors? Always when you have an immunodeficient or a diabetic patient or a liver or kidney infection, please be prepared. So this is important. Prophylaxis, how do we avoid? First use povidine iodine. How long is it, it is important? So even if you're preparing the eye on the periocular skin, it has to be there for three minutes. And if you're in installing it into the eye, it has to at least stay in the eye within one minute. So make sure you don't clean the eye and drape it immediately. Wait for at least three minutes to reduce the infection to about 95%. Then we have now antibiotics like intracameral moxifloxin and uh, cefiroxin. The efficacy wise, both uh, there is no significant difference. You can use either of it. Uh, there is a study where uh, uh, by uh, LVPI where they have used uh, amikacin in their uh, BSS. And uh, always uh, do a culture to know what organism it is uh, and uh, treat it according to it. Nowadays, we also have RT-PCR, which is giving quite good uh, reports. So it is always good when you take a, a, a sample, it is always you, in you can do a RT-PCR test if your cultures are coming negative. Fungal is a dreadful complication. You need uh, the treatment is uh, pars plana vitrectomy in today's era because you have uh, small gauge vitrectomy and uh, always explain a poor prognosis. So this is a case where you could see a plaque which is there on the uh, capsule. Uh, so this is a post-operative uh, propionobacterium axis. What is important is uh, you could do a very good uh, cleanup of the posterior capsule. You don't have to remove the eye oil in first go and do a good vitrectomy with antibiotics. Sometimes you would have uh, uh, acute endophthalmitis with retinitis, so it is always good uh, to inject oil in such cases because oil has an antibiotic and antifungistatic uh, uh, abilities. And this is my last case where you could see a, a CME on this thing uh, on first, uh, this is around uh, one month post-op. So this went away, cystoid macular emblema postoperatively. This is the most common complication. This goes away usually with the topical treatments. So always try for a month with topical steroids and topical NSAIDs. It doesn't go down, then go for intravitreal uh, steroids. Or uh, in uh, resistant or recalcitrant cases, we do vitrectomy. So this is how the patient has improved. Nowadays, we also have the suprachoroidal uh, uh, tramcinolone injections, which you could try, and it is really working well. I have a series of around 50 patients of different etiologies where I have given suprachoroid tramcinolone. It stays for long, there's less IOP rise, and uh, it is also quite efficacious. So this is a case of dialysis. It's not the pupil. This is a dialysis, and uh, uh, you can uh, do a very good uh, dialysis repair to avoid the photophobia and glare for a patient. This is a modified sewing technique which I've used. For small dialysis, always do a spontaneous reattachment. If it is a larger dialysis, uh, uh, you always have to go and intervene. Uh, these are the last cases which I just wanted to show you. This is one is you have IOL on the uh, retina and uh, 
you have a nucleus on the retina so what do you do you just have to keep your calm and close the case and send it to a vr person because they're better to deal it and it is very easy to deal if the retina is attached for a retina person thank you any doubts so uh, in this how many people are using intracameral uh, moxie good at least 50 percent make into 100 percent so ours is our high volume center we are using intracameral moxie for all cases for the last four years no end of thalmitis. so but be careful about the dosage. Be careful about the company. Because whoever gives uh, free samples, if you try, you may land in talks. So uh, uh, rely on a reliable company and uh, give intracameral moxie that avoids it. As far as the, if you are a solo practitioner, if you are a solo practitioner, if any complication like doubtful task, doubtful end of thalmatis, please refer to retina. That will relieve your uh, tension in the brain and uh, future legal litigation. If you have a smallest doubt, also refer it. What is there? Nothing wrong. You feel that my practice may, that fellow may take out. Never. The, you feel that I, uh, that fellow may criticize me. No. Make a friendly before starting cataract. Make a friend of a, a retina before starting your uh, practice. And any small doubt, refer it. It is his headache to differentiate TAS from that of the end of the As far as the TAS is concerned, what they say is don't do surgical intervention. It causes patrol over the fire. Already inflamed the eye. Again, making a surgical intervention in a task case is a worse thing. Whereas in the end of thalmitis, earlier, the better. Yes. The next, so pre the next presentation is uh, PCR management and secondary IOLs by Dr. Meher Tej. Th thank you. Uh, just for the information of everybody here, I and uh, Dr. Nehar, uh, retina surgeons, if you want to make friends with us. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, ophthalmology is uh, supposedly a very uh, friendly branch, uh, a tension-free branch. But like Dr. Uh, Ravi Kumar Reddy sir has said, uh, it can give you sleepless nights if even one patient uh, that you've operated has a PCR or nucleus drop. Uh, you, I mean, in, in, the, in the interest of time, uh, I'll be skipping all these slides uh, where you can study all this in the books and magazines. So I'll, I'll be showing more of uh, what to be done when you have a PCR. This is a normal case that I'm, uh, I actually I'm a FACO and a VR surgeon. I do a lot of FACOs. Uh, this is a grade one cataract. I'm, uh, I, I already I've made a crater. I w I'm unable to divide this nucleus into two pieces. I am trying to rotate the nucleus. It's not happening properly. It's not rotating freely. By this time, if nothing is going as per plan, you have to suspect that something bad has happened. And some by something bad, I mean there must have been a PCR. Watch closely there. Sudden momentary expansion of pupil sudden appearance of red reflex. The most important thing here is do not remove your phaco probe immediately. Uh, inject uh, dispersive OVD into the eye. Uh, if you remove the phaco probe immediately here, uh, you'll be expanding the rent as well as pulling, uh, you'll be pulling the vitreous uh, into the anterior chamber. And again, it's a vicious cycle. You'll be cutting and you'll be pulling more vitreous. So here, uh, how this is, an, I mean, what I did was, since this is a grade one nucleus, uh, and most uh, advanced FACO machines that we have today have a vitrectomy setup, uh, I went ahead with uh, cutter from the side port. Uh, I tried to remove the uh, nucleus piece by piece, 
and uh, see uh, remember that there are two modes in the vitrectomy machine ICA and IAC irrigation cutting aspiration irrigation aspiration cut if you suspect there is vitreous in the anterior chamber always first cut and then aspirate uh, use a triamcinolone estonide in the anterior chamber to if you are unable to uh, visualize the vitreous uh, if you are sure that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber that then you can go into the aspiration cutting mode uh, you can change hands uh, to access the subincisional uh, cortex. Uh, this has been possible because uh, it was a grade 1 or 2 nucleus. So if it was a grade 3 or 4 nucleus, probably I would have managed it differently. Uh, the key, key thing here is uh, mm -hmm. when you're, uh, you are, uh, actually the, if you can see the, sorry. So uh, always, in, uh, if you're sure that the rent has not ex extended, uh, you can go ahead with the IOL that you have pre-planned to put inside there in, in the bag. You just uh, inject it away from the PCR. And uh, in the end, make sure that, that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber. So this is one case which has been dealt this way. And uh, sometimes when you have a large PCR and there is no adequate uh, and there is adequate uh, anterior capsular support, do a good vitrectomy and you can put a three piece IOL with haptics placed over the capsular anterior capsular rim and then push the optic under the anterior capsular rim for a more physiological position. Like I said, uh, inject triamcinolone estonide into the anterior chamber to make sure that there is no vitreous. So what are secondary IOLs? Uh, any IOL that is not placed primarily during the first surgery can be a secondary IOL. Uh, sometimes due to pre-existing conditions or intraoperative complications, the uh, uh, primary IOL may not be possible. We have a range of uh, secondary IOL implants like uh, AC IOLs. Uh, Dr. Neha has just shown you how to do a, a SF IOL. My next speaker, uh, Dr. Jayamadri, will be showing iris fixated IOLs, but we'll just show a short video uh, of uh, iris fixated IOL. Uh, this is a grade 5 nucleus preoperatively before the surgery when I have seen uh, something uh, has alerted me and I didn't go ahead with FACO in this case. I wanted to do an SICS. I didn't notice any uh, zonular dialysis uh, preoperatively. Observe carefully when I uh, try to do capsulotomy. The whole bag complex is moving along with my uh, cystitome. Just, just see there. The whole bag is shifting. Uh, So, but still uh, at this point of time, I'm still thinking how to proceed with this case. I went ahead with a Rexis, which was not very big due to the zonular dialysis. After completing the small Rexis, I have made radial cuts. see what happened later you you have seen how dr ravikumar redigaru has uh, safely removed uh, cataracts with visco expression now i am showing you how to safely remove the whole bag with vitreous expression this visco expression
so that's the visco underneath the bag that's the nucleus and that's the bag do not try this at home since i'm a vr surgeon uh, and i can place a secondary iol uh, at this point of time i uh, I, I could have placed uh, ac iol or an sf iol or an iris fixated iol uh, in this case i went ahead with an iris iol i'll be skipping this part as uh, dr jaya madri will be spe speaking with uh, uh, speaking about iris iols uh, uh, iris iols can have uh, good post op pictures like this uh, patients retain good vision uh, and uh, j uh, already Dr. Neha, Neha has shown you a Gabor's technique. I'll just show you a short video of uh, 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 a modified uh, uh, transconjunctival technique of uh, uh, SFIOL. It's called the Yaman's technique. He's a Japanese ophthalmologist where a 30 gauge needle is uh, injected uh, uh, and the haptic is stuck inside and it is held firmly by an assistant and another 30. 30 other uh, haptic Meher, is if you can close your presentation and sure it'll be nice of you sure thank you sure thank you and uh, i also want to tell that acls are not a bad option whatever works in your hands previously acls were contraindicated because uh, they led to uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathies but if you have a if you do a good pi and a good vitrectomy acls uh, d also do very well so do what works in your hand like dr ravikumar reddy sir said under promise and over deliver. Thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I call the next speaker for the paucity of time. Srikan, you are a time. A very good afternoon. Uh, basically, um, there are so many uh, reservations or apprehension to do an iris claw procedure. I have been recently talking to one of my colleagues and then I realized there is so much of uh, apprehension to be, uh, because owing to all these reasons. So now here I'm presenting my journey in, in iris claw for the past 10 years, what I have learned from my mistakes and what I have learned from others' mistakes and what I have learned while teaching. And at this point, I, I would like to thank the AIOS and the APOS for giving me this opportunity. So now, first question comes, what extra workup is needed? Basically, nothing extra is needed. Do a routine workup, whatever you do for a uh, routine cataract surgery, with a slight importance to various parameters, like what is the pupil size, what, where is the si site of the PI, and assessment of the sulcus, either clinically. Clinically, if sulcus is present, well and good, place an uh, sulcus IOL. If you are not able to uh, determine the integrity of the sulcus clinically, you can use uh, UVM for the determination of the sulcus. And indirect ophthalmoscopy is a must to detect any presence of any peripheral retinal degeneration, if so present, barrage them. The next question apprehension is, do we really need a VR setup? No. What a routine uh, anterior vitrectomy, what we use in the management of a PCR, is enough. And I always, I, again, I'm stressing, doing an iris claw without a good vitrectomy, I will say it is a crime. Because if your vitrectomy is not proper, you will land up in complications, which I will again highlight in the uh, next slide. Now, which case should I select? Very simple, any case of an aphakia with a good iris sub, uh, tissue support and in the absence of a uh, integrate, I mean, good sulcus. The pupil size, even if you have a larger pupil like this, that, that much of iris is again sufficient to have a, uh, to place an iris claw IOL. I divide the indications as a planned or an unplanned procedure. The planned indications are various subluxated uh, lenses or a subluxated IOLs where these can be explanted and you can place an uh, iris claw. And as a ref uh, aphakic rehabilitation uh, procedure where there is no adequate sulcus. Uh, unplanned indications where you have a large PCR or a large zonular dialysis where you cannot face, uh, place in a sulcus or a bad IOL. Now, what instruments do I need? No need of any extra instruments. Instruments. Basically, I use a shepherd's forceps where you have a good stability. 
If you don't have a sh uh, shepherd's forceps, even the work can be done with the uh, help of a McPherson's forceps or an intraocular retinal forceps. To enclave the iris tissue, uh, it's better to use a reverse Sinsky or a rod uh, so that it is less traumatic to the iris. In their absence, you can still go ahead with the Sinsky hook. Now, is the uh, technique so difficult? Absolutely no. It is a very simple technique with a very minimal learning curve. Now, coming to the procedure, I would, uh, you can, I mean, ma majority of the times I do it as a uh, secondary procedure or sometimes I, uh, my, with my, help with the, uh, my help of my colleague, I do the, uh, as a combined procedure. My first step is always a side port, especially in a vitrectomized eye, better to do the side ports first. And the incision can be either temporal or uh, uh, superior. The incision can be either corneal or, or scleral. I always prepare, uh, prefer a superior corneal uh, incision just to save the conjunctiva for the, if at all you need any future traps. And also, if in a scleral section, the AC might be collapsing. The AC stability is more better in a uh, corneal incision. Once the IOL is placed through the side port with the reverse Sinsky, you can, uh, the iris can be tucked. And note the movement of the, uh, direction of how the reverse Sinsky or a rod can be used and it should be like when you are tucking it should be only one direction one vertical down and come out you should not have a up and down movement and if you actually see here when I do my side port first before the uh, main entry the AC is more stable now in the first video first the main port was done and then now I'm trying to do a side port and see how the eyeball collapses. This is my first, uh, this was a video which I have recorded 10 years back and this was my first uh, mistake which I have learned. And from then I always do my side ports first. In cases of coloboma or a small eyes, the uh, claw can be easy, easily put owing to its smaller size. And now the thing is, what complications should I deal with? When things are done in the right way, the complications are less likely to happen. That's my 10 years post-op pictures where the results are absolutely fantastic. But definitely it is not without any complications. We can have an ovalization of the pupil. I don't call this as a complication, but uh, it is something like probably the patient might be cosmetically not very happy, but no disturbance to the vision. There can be pigment dispersions that are likely to happen, which can have an impact on the vision. But this can be easily dealt by using a topical steroid. If the topical steroids are not helpful, I use the YAG laser to uh, disturb the pigments. The site of enclavation, they can be uh, iris atrophy, which can lead to loss of enclavation. If there is only one site, if it has lost the enclavation, the anterior segment surgeon says they can just prolapse it into the AC, the other, uh, whichever is lost in enclavation and can be refixed. If it has totally dropped down, yes, my friends are definitely, the, my retinal friends are definitely here to help me out. If the things are not done in the right way, we can land up in situations like this. But again, no need to uh, apprehend. These can be again disenclaved and again re-enclaved also. Yes, disenclavation of the iris, uh, iris claw is definitely tricky, but not an impossible task. The another one thing, the most important thing is the site of the PI. As the name suggests, peripheral iridectomy, it should be done. It is, has to be done in the periphery. Now in this case, there is a mid-peripheral iridectomy. So when I dilated the patient, the uh, optic edge got uh, captured and it landed up in a pupillary block glaucoma. Because I'm handling the uveal tissue, one can anticipate the uh, presence of a CME. Now, Theoretically, yes, but practically, it is like very uh, less chances of having. Even if you develop, probably. Dr. Madhuri, if you can just finish yeah, your. Just two minutes. I mean, it's almost done. Uh, there is a chance, but it can be because not because of the claw IOL well as such, but it might be because of the. Because we have handled like two, three times surgery, that also can be a reason for uh, si um, CME, and it can be dealt in the usual way. Because of the gross pseudophacodonosis, I'm sorry, the video is not working. The, because of the pseudophacodonosis, 
that actually induces a PVD, which can be a risk factor to uh, for the development of an RD. This is where actually the SFL scores over an iris law. If you do a proper vitrectomy, the uh, uh, vitreous is not in contact with the uh, optic. So there is less chances of having a PVD induction. So uh, by doing in a proper methodological way, a good workup, things can be right and you will have better uh, achievements. Happy clawing, thank you. Dr. Harika? Yeah, go ahead. Today I will be discussing three case scenarios of IOL exchange. The cataract surgery has transitioned from a therapeutic procedure in the 80s to a refractive procedure where we're trying to push the limits of what we can basically give our patients. So it's no longer the fact that I can put a lens in and you can wear glasses to see well. The concept has changed now when we're really trying to push the barriers of this limit to what we can achieve. And in order to do that, you need to have an accurate formula of calculation of where your lens is going to fit itself, which is the effective lens position. So now, now we have this fourth generation Barrett formulas, which can actually give our effective lens position. It takes into account multiple parameters to predict where the lens is going to fit itself. So with optical biometry, we can reduce the errors with applination biometry of axial lens. And Zexus is of paramount importance if we're going to place any IOL. Coming to the first scenario, this is, this is an IOL exchange I did for a refractive surprise. A 67-year-old female came with complaints of diminution of vision in the right eye since three months. And in the left eye, since uh, she had poor vision since 10 years. She gave a history of undergoing cataract surgery at a camp 10 years ago. And vision in the right eye was 660, and in the left eye, she was reading CF at one meter. Right eye, she had NS3 dense PSCC, and in the left eye was pseudophagic. She had a myopic fundus. So I went ahead and did an FACO and implanted a lens of plus eight. She came back for a one week follow up, and then she asked me if I could do something for her left eye. And we found out that in her left eye with minus 12 she was able to read 612 and in the AR it showed uh, minus 13 spherical and minus 2 sill. Her left eye OCT was normal and the optical biometry in her left eye in pseudophagic mode was about plus 4. I do have the video for this, but unfortunately. Okay. So I explanted the rigid IOL and placed the plus four lens, and she had a plano refractive error. So out of curiosity, I wanted to find out the power of the rigid lens. It was turned out to be plus 21, when in fact she should have had a plus four. The second case was an IOL exchange for a calcified IOL. This is a 52 year old female diabetic since 15 years. She had gradual vision loss since 14 months. She underwent cataract in the right eye 16 months ago and in the left eye five years ago. The visual acuity in the left eye was about the hand movement and she, in the anterior segment, revealed calcified IOL. Obviously, I couldn't see the fundus, so I did a B scan. It was normal. Uh, in, I did an optical biometry in pseudophagic mode and explanted the calcified hydrophobic IOL and implanted the aspheric hydrophobic lens. Post-op, she had 6-6 six, six vision in both the eyes. This is an interesting case. This is a 52-year-old male goldsmith, so he obviously had high visual demand. He came with the complaint of vision, diminution of vision in the right eye since four months. He had undergone uh, left eye cataract surgery five years ago. In the right eye, he had vision of 6.6, six, and in the left eye, he was able to see 6.9. With plus 3, he was able to read properly. Biomicroscopy showed um, NS2 to 3 in the right eye, and he had a monofocal uh, lens in the left eye. Posterior segment was normal. He wanted to work with uh, 
as he's a goldsmith, he wanted to see near vision without his glasses, so went ahead and did a multifocal lens. He was seeing well in his left eye, but not as well as he wanted. And he was highly motivated to get a multifocal, so I went ahead and did a exchange, explanted the monofocal lens and implanted the multifocal lens in his left eye. Again, the video isn't playing. Uh, this was the uh, common uh, indication for PCIOL explantation. The most common is IOL dislocation. The second is the IOL incorrect power, which is a post cataract refractive surprise. The third is IOL opacification, which is most common with hydrophilic lenses. And the uh, fourth is the persistent iritis. And the UGH is the uveitis, glaucoma, and high FEMA syndrome. Even though IOL exchange is a fairly simple procedure, it does have its fair share of complications, the most obvious of which is capsular rupture, which can lead to vitreous loss. Now, if the IOL is sitting in the eye for a long time, the capsule can fry mold, and when the lens is, tried, uh, lens is tugged with force, it can lead to zonular dialysis, which can in turn lead to retinal tears, and it can lead to cystoid macular edema in the long run. The take-home message is IOL exchange must be done only when the visual problems in the IO current IOL cannot be managed by non-surgical means, and thorough counseling to the patient is required regarding all the complications, and each case is unique, and the decision to perform IOL exchange should be tailored according to the individual patient needs and circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harika. So I think any doubts? We have one more minute left. Fine, then let's close the session. Nowadays, uh, only in the last two months, I have seen three opacified IOLs. So be careful in selecting the company. So this fellow pushes with the new company, and uh, free of cost, you take some samples and uh, implant. So after three, four years, you face the problem. So be careful about this opacification of the lenses. Uh, in only in a span of two months, I have seen three cases. So be careful. Uh, can I have a photo with the all speaker? Huh? Yeah, you can proceed. We, yeah, 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 we have done so many cases with the renal implants who are on the spheroids. So, yeah, you can proceed. No problem. One photo. <laughs>